Vaiji ji ka khalsa, Vaiji ji ka Vaiji ji ki fateh. Good afternoon, good evening, and welcome uh, to everyone. And uh, this is our eighth series in uh, regarding the farm farm laws and the farm protests which is happening in India. And uh, today we have the privilege of having uh, the Supreme Court attorney, a long time attorney, uh, attorney uh, Mr. Colin Gonzalez, who is here to present his talk, and. Uh, Attorney Colin Gonzalez is the founder of the Human Rights Law Network in India's leading public interest law group. Upon attaining his law degree in 1983, Mr. Gonzalez co-founded the Human Rights Law Network and had developed it into a national organization bringing together over 200 lawyers and paralegals, <coughs> excuse me, operating out of 28 offices spread throughout India. Mr. Gonzalez transitioned his practice from the labor courts to the Bombay High Court in 1984 and was designated as a senior advocate before moving into the Supreme Court of India in 2000. He has brought numerous precedent setting cases to the Supreme Court and High Court of various states. Amongst these cases was a right to food case in the Supreme Court of India, which ordered subsidized grain to be given to 700 million poor, poor persons. Mr. Gonzalez has written, edited, and co-edited a number of articles and books on a range of human rights law issues. He was presented with the International Human Rights Award by the American Bar Association in 2005. In 2010, he was conferred a doctorate of the University uh, Honor Causes by the University of Middlesex, UK. He was given the Mother Teresa Memorial Award for Social Justice in recognition of remarkable contribution in legal services addressing human rights in 2010 and an award for the Center of Reproductive Rights in New York in 2015 for pioneering an exemplary leadership in advancing women's reproductive rights and social justice in India. He was awarded the Right Livelihood Award in 2017. Welcome, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Why Guruji ka Khalsa? Why Guruji ki Fateh? Thank you all. Thank you all for this invitation to speak with you all today. The farmers' agitation is truly a historic agitation of the kind that this country has never seen. And we are standing at a crossroads as we speak today. Nobody knows where this agitation is going to go. Everybody understands that the whole of Punjab and I think large parts of the agricultural community across the country are angry and burning with frustration and despair at what is happening in the agricultural sector. The farmers' struggle is not just for the demands of the farmers in Punjab, it's a struggle for the survival of agriculture as we know it today. And it's a struggle for the transition from agriculture as we know it today to complete corporate control of agriculture, the displacement of millions of people from the agriculture sector, and a huge migration of the type that this country has not seen since partition of persons from agriculture to small towns and cities. Mr. Chidambaram famously said when he was in power as the Home Minister that we envisage a movement of 40% of the population at the very minimum from agriculture to the urban areas. And it was the kind of the model that the Englishman had, the British Lords had, to clear the countryside of people. But the historical difference is very important to be kept in mind because when the migration took place in Europe, you were talking of very small populations in the first place. So when the migrations took place to the cities and fueled the industrial revolution, there were small numbers of people. But here you're talking of hundreds of millions of people being forced off agriculture to go to the cities. So the farmers' agitation is an agitation for the country, not just for farmers. The agitation in Punjab is an agitation for all Indians, not just for Punjabis. 
and they fight for the survival of India. It's a truly a battle for the heart and soul of India. Now, what the central government proposes to do, let me talk of that briefly, because I believe you've had many lectures before this, so you have an idea, but let me re restate some of the main points regarding the four laws that they propose to bring into India. And the first point that we want to make is that agriculture is a state subject in the constitution. And agriculture has always been held to be a state subject. There has never been any demo or discussion contrary to the stated position that agriculture is absolutely and entirely a state subject. And when we say it is a state subject, what we are saying is that only the state government can make laws relating to agriculture. Now the central government wants to come in and the motivation or the thinking behind this intervention with these farm laws is to have the corporate sector take over agriculture. Grab the agricultural credit, which they already have, and take over agriculture completely. And for the central government to do that, they needed to make laws. And once you make a law, you need to justify a law. So the main justification of the central government is reference to entry 33 in the concurrent list, which deals with foodstuff. And they say that foodstuffs include agriculture. No, agriculture is agriculture agricultural markets, the production of food grains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And foodstuff is a very particular phrase used. And you would never, nobody would ever use the word foodstuff for agriculture. Now entry 33 in the concurrent list, the concurrent list is the list where the state and the center may legislate, was made a long, long time ago. And it was made with the purpose of, and it goes back to the Second World War period, where the central government felt the need to prevent uncontrolled rise in prices of foodstuffs. It had nothing to do with agriculture, agricultural markets, Mondays, minimum support price, it had nothing to do with that. And therefore, entry 33 in the Constitution was put in to enable the central government to legislate regarding the price of foodstuffs. Right? And it was the forerunner, if you like, or the foundation of the Essential Commodities Act, which basically permits the central government to intervene and regulate the price of foodstuffs with nothing to do with agriculture. So the big battle in the Supreme Court, if it comes to that at all, will be our perception that agriculture is agriculture is entirely a state subject. And our explanation or our rebuttal to, this, to the argument of the central government that entry 33, which is foodstuff, includes agriculture, is this, that it had nothing to do with agriculture and it was only meant for the control of the prices of these things. Well, that's the first argument. Now, what is the plan? If you look at these four farm laws, the, one of the most important things is the mandi. And one of the most important mond uh, models is actually the Punjab model. And that's why we say the farmers are actually struggling for the whole of India. Is the model where you have a mandi, where the farmers come, they pay a small fee for the maintenance of the mandis and for the making of the roads and so on in the, in the surrounding areas, the expenses of running a mandi and so on. But most important, the mandi ensures 
that the food grains are purchased at the minimum support price. And the minimum support price is truly the heart of the matter. So here again, the farmers are struggling for their own survival, but they're also struggling for what is the critical element in this epic battle, which is the minimum support price. Now, what this intends to do, first farm law, I'll give you the name of that is called the Farmers Produce Trade, Commerce, Promotion and Facilitation Act 2020, which is uh, humorously nicknamed by the farmers as the APMC Bypass Act, the uh, Agricultural Produce Market Act is the older act. It, it, it enables the earlier legislation was the APMC Act. It is the legal foundation of the Mandis. And it sets in motion that procedure of farmers bringing their produce, selling it at the minimum support price, and generally being reasonably happy with that whole system. And now you have an act which is called the Facilities Act, which facilitates the dismantling of the Mandi. Because it allows any private player in that you can read in that basically all these agro businesses and corporations who are coming into this business, they can set up a Monday anywhere. You don't have to pay a cess, therefore there is no, you know, support, financial stability to a Monday. It comes under no regulation of the government at all. And the most important factor that when the corporation set up these Mondays, there is no minimum support price requirement. Simple. Mondays with minimum support prices and corporation Mondays. Wrongly called Mondays, actually, they'll be looting, looting, looting areas where the farmers will come one by one, face the enormous power of a reliance or an Adani or whatever it is. And the tiny farmer will have to negotiate pathetically with this mighty corporation or be turned away. And just sell at whatever price the corporation commands. So that's, that's the function of one act. Now, they say the farmers will get better prices. They say the farmers can negotiate. But the fact is that in many parts of the country today, even where there are mandis, farmers have the opportunity of selling on the open market. So they have a dual choice. They can come to the mandis and sell at minimum support prices and they can do elsewhere. But if the mandi is demolished and if the government wins this battle against the seed farmers, and pushes through these acts, then your money gets decimated. Because the legislative and governmental support needed for a money to survive will then go. And you'll have private players in the field and the farmers will be totally at the mercy of these. Now, there's a second act which we need to take a close look at, and that's the Essential Commodities Act. And the Essential Commodities Act, Section 3, I think, says that the central government may, if it finds that the prices are not suitable, excessive, etc., the essential commodities are being sold in the market at very high rates, the central government may step in and regulate the price of essential actives. And now with the new act coming in, which uh, is the Essential Commodities Amendment Act 2020, 
that role of the central government in regulating the price of essential items is going to disappear. And now excluded from the definition of essential items are items such as cereals, pulses, potatoes, onions, and foodstuffs. And foodstuffs is a very controversial and ambiguous item, which means that this very salutary and regulatory kind of provision, which enables foodstuff prices to be controlled in the public interest and makes punishable the hoarding of essential items by hoarders and blackmailers, that is going to go. So look at what the government does. It destroys the Mondays phase one, playing entirely into the hands of corporations. And second, whatever is produced, whatever is essential for the public, control on the prices of those essential items is going. So you can see the present government playing such a naked pro-corporation role, it's almost as if they hand over the governance of this country and the running of this country to private corporations. And third, you have what is called the Contract Farming Act. And the Contract Farming Act makes contracts between these individual farmers and the mighty corporations legal. Now today, if a farmer goes, for example, in Punjab and there's an MSP and you entered into contracts, no court is going to believe that. The court will, uh, section 23 of the Contract Act has a phrase called unconscionable contracts namely a contract between a weak party and a strong party, signed by the weak party, but void. The court will hold these contracts void because of the imbalance in the playing field, so to speak, and the unequal power of both these parties. But now with the enactment of this new law, contracts between individual farmers, financially weak farmers, and mighty corporations will be perfectly valid. Now, once these contracts are valid, and if a farmer is unable to, let's say, several months down the line when his crop is ready, unable to hand over his crop to the corporate houses at the price stipulated in the contract, then the farmer is liable to lose his land. The central government has been saying, no, there's no such provision that he can use. But a careful reading of this law shows that yes, by an adjudication process, an adjudicator who's a very low level government official can adjudicate and say, yes, this crop is to give, be given at this price, you have defaulted. Therefore, in recovery of your debt, this part of your land will be handed over sold in the public auction or handed over to the corporation as the deal, whatever deal is entered into, etc. Et so these are the elements of the law that is coming. I cannot imagine a darker system of laws for agriculture. And it could well be said that if we lose this farm battle, which the farmers of Punjab are so heroically entered into, if we lose this battle, all is lost and the face of India will change. You can imagine the migration that is taking place today from agriculture to the small towns and cities is already of a magnitude. And if you count the migration over a decade or so, is already of a magnitude comparable to partition. So farmers in very large numbers have already began the migration first to the small towns and then to the, and then to the cities and so on. But you can imagine once these laws change and the mandis disappear and government intervention stops, 
and minimum support price is not available for any farmer to demand, Chidambaram's old dream of moving 40% of the population in the villages to the cities will come true in a very short period of time. And a massive migration, massive distress will take place. Selling of lands by the, by the, by the farmers, renting of lands to corporations by the farmers, massive consolidation of areas, the use of technology and so on, which could be used even in a cooperative model. All this will happen and the face of India will change forever. Many rich people will grow richer, as the cliche goes, and the cities and small towns and even the agricultural areas will be filled with people in great distress. And how can you have wealth of this magnitude living side by side with abject poverty of, uh, of 10 times, 100 times that magnitude? is a mystery that no one will be able to solve. And uprisings and insurrections and revolutions against this regime will soon to be formed. Now that's one part. I want to take you to a second part, which is a case which is pending on farmer suicide in the Supreme Court. It's Kranti versus Union of India. And it is linked to the present crisis that we see. And I want to say in a few words, some of the elements of that case. Many of you know that 306,000 farmers, three lakhs, I'm sorry, three lakhs, 6,000 farmers have been documented to have committed suicide over the last 20 years. Now let that figure sink in. Three lakh farmers taking their lives, hanging themselves from trees, drinking pesticide, and doing all other kinds of acts to take their lives in a period of 20 years. And our governments have become so cruel, so despotic, so criminal minded, both governments, the Congress and the BJP alike, that you have deaths on this genocidal scale and not a thing done to help the farmers, not a thing. Done. The only thing they do now, which is the recent trend, is to break up suicides into two parts. Earlier it came under farmer suicide, so agricultural laborers or very small farmers committing suicide and farmer suicides were clubbed together. In the NCRB data, National Crime Records Bureau data of the police. But now they've broken up into two parts, farmer suicides and agricultural worker suicides. And government proudly announces that now we have a decline in the number of farmer suicides taking place. Whereas all that they've done is that they've taken 50% of the earlier deaths by farmers and put them in the category called deaths by farm labor and labor employed on farms and so on. So a new category and so they show a drop in the number of deaths and so on. But suicides continue at an alarming rate right across the country even today. Two, Minimum support price, we have a government report, a high-powered government report called the Ramesh Chand government report, which said that you must count minimum support price by including skilled wages. That is to say the work of the farmer as a skilled laborer should be counted. Today you count labor as unskilled labor. So what you count in your, what you set as your MSP counts the labor input as unskilled labor. Second, it counts land rent, the notional land rent, with a very quickly imposed ceiling. So Ramesh Chand said, whatever rent the farmer pays for that land, land at all, 
in the case of tenant farmers, must be calculated at the actual rent. Third, interest on working capital for the farmer must be put as part of the inputs. And when you say interest on working capital, Ramesh Chand said also, it's not just capital taken from the banks, but also money taken from money lenders and the rate of urgerous interest, which 80% of farmers go through, that must also be put as part of the input. And finally, the, uh, the, uh, the insurance and the expenses incurred for the whole of the farming period, not half, as is the calculation. So basically, the Ramesh Chand committee said the way in which minimum support price is calculated is very faulty, needs to be checked, and this was a government committee. And so the demand of the farmers for minimum support price is a minimum support price with all these requirements. Now, Prime Minister Modi proudly announced, and he deceived the country when he did that, he proudly announced that, yes, we are going to implement minimum support price. We're going to have minimum support price. And then, and as you know, there was a National Commission on Farmers headed by Swaminathan. And Swaminathan did the calculations and Ramesh Chand did the calculations. And everyone thought that the Prime Minister was going to do something spectacular. And then when he showed us how those calculations were being done, he had a formula, we found that he went back to the old calculations, which had nothing to do with the real notion of minimum support price. And as a result today, you have farmers throughout the country, though you have minimum support price stipulated for some items only, very few items, farmers are routinely selling their produce at 30% below the minimum support. Now you go to crop insurance, which is the reason for farmer suicide, particularly tenant farmer suicides. There are nine crore agricultural households. Only 20% are covered by insurance. And what does the government do? It gives 25,000 crores of core money, insurance money, not to the farmers, it gives it to the very companies that are now set to exploit the workers. So the money goes to the companies, disasters take place, crop losses take place, the farmers go to the insurance companies and say, please, and remember only 20% are covered by this insurance. They go and ask them please for their money and they don't get the money. And it's a huge scandal in the country that the government gave the money to corporations who are not handing the money over to the farmers. And you have a CAG report on this, and CAG said the Comptroller and Auditor General said, we must audit this company to find out why they are hoarding the money given to them by the government for dispersing the money. Now we come to tenant farmers and women farmers. There's another big scandal brewing here because women farmers who constitute a huge bulk of farming operations, particularly the dairy operations and all regular farming operations as well. Women farmers are not, are not registered as farmers. Tenant farmers, a large body, 80% of tenant farmers in this country are not registered as farmers. So when the government says we are extending our scheme for farmers, you must understand that they're excluding women farmers and tenant farmers. Now, item number four, disaster relief, which is today at 5,000 per hectare, should there be hailstorm or some disaster or a tornado or a cyclone and so on, 5,000 per hectare today. But the Huda Committee report, which is also a cent high powered central government report, made many years ago, many years ago, said it shouldn't be 5,000, it should be 35,000 a hectare, a manifold increase. Not done. So the Huda Committee report, 
is a governmental, central government report. The Ramesh Chand report on MSP is a central government report. So why doesn't the central government follow the recommendations of its own high power committees? There's no answer to that at all. So disaster relief remains pitiable and the disbursement of that pitiable amount remains also very poor. Who are the companies engaged in all this insurance and agribusinesses and so on? Reliance, ICICI Lombard, Tata AIG, and many other companies. And their corporate records show, the balance sheets and so on show, that this is the fastest growing industry in the company, in the country, growing at the rate of 32% per year. Take the money from the government, don't disperse it. Grow rich on the poverty and misery and the debts of the farmers. And this is what you call criminal conduct by corporations. Now you have debt indebtedness and the indebtedness in India of farmers stands at 50%. One reason, and we're looking now at insurance and agricultural credit, According to the policy of the government of India, 8% of agricultural credit, credit, 8% should go for priority lending to farmers. Now you look at this carefully. Where did this go? And here the government introduced an amendment in what is called the farmer. And farming was amended to include agro-businesses and allied activities. So all the money that should go to farmers and particularly small and marginal farmers, that was the definition for priority lending. And now with the amendment in the term farming, agri-businesses, a lot of that is going to small towns where these agri-businesses have been set up by corporations. So the corporations capture, they capture the credit available for priority lending to small farmers. This is the situation which has led to farmer suicides which continue every year. The newspapers are now owned by corporations so that reporting has stopped. Many of the media houses are now owned by big companies. Many of those fearless journalists who used to come on television incessantly are now missing because they've been sacked en masse. And we know the story of that uh, takeover by corporations of the media houses. And so it is very hard on the normal television channels and on the national newspapers, it is very hard to get information regarding the biggest crisis that this country has ever experienced, the crisis of agriculture. The Punjab farmers are truly the freedom fighters of today. They are the new generation freedom fighters trying to free India from a power even more deadly than our colonial masters. We can say that with certitude. Utsa Patnaik wrote a book called The Republic of Hunger, where she compared hunger in India today with hunger during the British period. The consumption of cereals, food grains and so on, British period, with the consumption of food grains today. And she found that hunger in India today was perhaps worse than it was during British period. So we criticize our colonial masters. We criticize them for what they did to India and to the Indian people. But today we are seeing a system of despotism much worse than under British. And our freedom fighters of today, 
including our farmers from Punjab and elsewhere, will face a power a hundred times more deadly than the colonial power. The power of the police, the power of the intelligence services, the power of the, the, the security forces, the paramilitary forces, to do incredible damage and to kill at will is a facet we have to take into account when analyzing this farmer's agitation and where it will go. The breaking free of a section of the Punjab farmers and going to the Red Fort where the Nissan flag was put up. And certain groups and certain leaders from the farming community said, we are ashamed that this has happened. It's a sign of the difference of opinion among the farmers groups themselves. They are struggling to keep unity and I believe that that unity will hold for no other reason, because there are groups there that are ready to sell out the government, but that unity will hold for this reason, that the young people of the Punjab are burning with fury and anger. Their blood is boiling. And whatever the government may do and take, maybe, you know, that we managed to curtail this movement or control this movement, the government of India knows that there is something fundamental and permanent in the fury that is developing in the countryside. Not just in the Punjab, but right across the country, in Maharashtra, in Karnataka, in the south, in the north, in the east, in the west. There is a fury building up in India. The older leaders may not be able to control that fury. Am I late? How much time do I have left? I'm a half an hour talk. You're okay. Right. How many minutes more do I have? Another five minutes would be fine. <laughs> five minutes, yeah. So there's a fury building up in India. And the young people of the Punjab, I don't know where this is going to go. Nobody seems to know. Nobody has any idea. But the res resilience and the determination of the farmers to carry on is indescribable. But I know that the security forces will have their intelligence from the moon in the villages of Punjab. This victory for the government is not possible because they have already lost the battle. If they continue on the path on which they go, which is the plan of the government of India to tire them out, hold on, make promises, but don't keep them. Pretend to negotiate. Call them again and again and again and repeat the same old government arguments. It is the, it is the stale strategy of the government of India, which has worked in the past. And so naturally you try it out again. But you're trying it out against the Punjab farmers <laughs> who are a different kettle of fish altogether. And you're trying it out against the young people from Punjab. Who are not known to, who are not known to capitulate too easily, and who have a courage that they learn from their gurus to give life, to give their own lives for a cause in which they believe. Nobody knows where this is going. But one thing is certain it will be a bloody battle. And I'm not talking about bloody battle in terms of guns and bombs and killings and things like that. But it will be a fundamental battle for the heart and soul of India. This government has done many, many, many terrible things. Again and again and again to the present COVID crisis where bungling took place on such a large scale, lying to the people, 
telling them untruths, telling them this is going to be all right. Total mismanagement of the COVID crisis so that as I sit in Delhi today, all around me people are dying. Lawyers, just a few minutes before this program started, a young lawyer, Mr. Ramesh, senior advocate who used to be arguing all the time and we would see him. He died an hour ago. Young people, old people, and the government doesn't tell them what's the truth. So it's going to be a decisive moment in terms of fundamental governance. Is this country going to be governed like this? Is the, is the majestic Indian nation, the proud, the glorious, the historic Indian nation, the largest democracy in the world, are we going to be governed like this? Are we going to treat our farmers like this? Go ahead. Strike as much as you want. Sit on the borders as much as you want. Sit in the rain. Sit in the cold. Sit in COVID. Government of India is not going to allow you to demonstrate. Like that Supreme Court order in the CAA case, Shane Bagh. Get up, you people. Get up. You have no right to demonstrate. Peaceful protestations of millions of people across the country against the CAA and the NRC, broken by a court order. And by hooligans who came and broke that tense. Is this governance? that we are going to tolerate. And so I conclude by saying again that the Sikh farmers are in the front. They are in the front line of the latest and largest agitation for the heart and soul of India, for the restoration of democracy, for the restoration of dignity, for peace in India, for equity in India, for survival of India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, I think, <laughs> I wish we had more time. Uh, I think after a long time, you've heard someone who's got to the heart of the matter and has been extremely candid. And uh, the picture is very bleak but you've put it out the way it is. And we can't thank you enough, and I can't thank you enough on behalf of the audience because this is the heart and the harsh truth. So thank you. Um, to the audience, uh, everyone's on mute. So please raise your hand, unmute, and ask your question. Please keep it extremely brief because I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions and uh, time is of the essence. So without much further ado, Whoever wants to ask the next question, please raise your hand and you can unmute and ask the question. Thank you. Okay, uh, I've got a question from uh, Jasbir Kaur. Please unmute. Okay, I just wanted to say, uh, I wanted to say to Mr. Gonzalez, he, he is just explaining um, the things, as you said, really, really, you know, that touch our heart. But my only question is, do you see um, anything coming out positive with, with all that energy and all that money and all that power and all, all that gut our farmers are showing and our youth are showing Will they be able to budge this government or no? See, Thank you. Uh, yeah, see, madam, uh, it depends on how you would understand a result. I would see the result as people being fundamentally mobilized, fundamentally changed in the way in which they are thinking and fundamentally energized to fight injustice. When we fought the British, you could never ask that question 
that you're struggling against the British in the Quit India movement and 10 years have passed, 20 years have passed, so many years have passed. Do you expect the British to go? And the people of India said, we don't think like that. We think in terms of the dedication of our lives to one aim, which is the restoration of the dignity of Indians. And it is with that certainty that we lay down our lives, generations of people laid down their lives, fighting against the British. It's the same. Don't look at it short term. Will the government of India agree tomorrow? Will they agree day after? They won't. This is the government that will not yield. Question is, the people yielded, the people gave up, the people surrendered, the people withdrew, the people stepped back again and again and again. And now the people are saying, we don't know. They would answer your question like this. We don't know, madam. We don't know when the government is going to change. We don't know when the government is going to accept what we are saying. We know one thing. We are not giving up. And that is your answer, ma'am. Don't ask. Tomorrow it will happen. After a month will it happen? Will the farmers go back demoralized? Now you know the answer. We are not giving up. To take our lives. We are not giving up. And then we see. We also don't know what is going to happen to our agitation. But we are not giving up. So we'll see. And once people are, have moral certitude, once people are morally totally dedicated to the path ahead of struggle, it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. And that's the answer, man. That's the answer. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, we've got Preetan there saying, uh, could you please unmute and ask your question? Uh, Thank you. Yes. Uh, so, uh, hello, everyone. So, my question to uh, Judge uh, Colin uh, Gonzalez is, uh, you mentioned that uh, since the farming was a state subject, why, you, according to you, uh, you think like uh, Supreme Court should have taken Suomoto uh, on this one and just said that, no, these are not people-friendly uh, laws, we should not consider them? See, the answer to that is this. That the Supreme Court is no longer people friendly. And if the Supreme Court is no longer people friendly, why would the Supreme Court go to identify a law which is not people friendly and set it down? Nowadays, speaking generally, not referring to any particular court, the judicial system is not necessarily aligned to implementing the constitution. Today, closeness with government, support for the government, despite some of the terrible things that it does, has become not unusual for the courts. So why do we think that the courts, which are supposed to uphold the constitution, will automatically look at these laws and say, we're going to set them aside. This is not the Supreme Court of the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, where there was a certain degree of rigor, love for human rights and independence of the government and the audacity and strength to stand up to the government and, you know, tell them what's what. Now it's not that situation. Now is the situation sometimes, not always, sometimes, of great closeness to the government, support for the government. We've seen that. So please don't look at the Supreme Court and say and think that, well, the Supreme Court will rush to the aid of the farmers. You've heard a Supreme Court judge saying repeatedly, and it's been reported in the newspapers, that you have no right to sit and block the traffic on the roads. He's the same judge who gave the order in Scheinberg. Terrible judgment on demonstrations. Traffic is more important than human rights and dignity and the right to demonstrate. Traffic. Same, twice he's made a statement now that you can't, you can't block the roads. 
You farmers may have a legitimate grievance, but you can't block the roads. So please don't expect anything to come out of the judiciary. Thank you, Mr. Expect Gonzalez. It to come out, expect results from the people in action, from the people in struggle. That's the only hope. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, we've got uh, Monica Kaur. Uh, please unmute and ask your question. Thank Hi, you. good morning. Happy Saturday. Okay, so morning. you're saying that um, both Congress and BJP are no good, which I agree with, but what other alternative do we have? No alternative at all. Okay, no so... Why, why, why are people in struggle, and that's the maturing of the struggle for human rights and dignity, <laughs> is that now we don't depend. Why should we? And we have, we have seen how political parties have let us down for so long. Is it that we go back into the same framework that we must have either the Congress or the BJP to come to our help and lead us. Maybe India is maturing, maybe social movements are maturing, and maybe they will set an example and say, if the farmers of India get together and the workers and downtrodden get together, maybe the political parties will come behind us. They will follow us and we will lead. Why don't we have a framework where the people of India, the dispossessed and the poor and the downtrodden and the farmers will lead the movements, not the political parties. So that time is over. That time is over. It's a new so period. That time is over. What I'm trying to understand is that, are you saying the two-party system is not working? Or are you saying that the democratic process itself in India has failed? Well, you can say both. The two-party system is the two-party system. Both of them are for, for the upper classes, right? Both of them favor the rich against the poor. What can you do? That's the way it develops. And maybe democracy is a very faulty democracy in India, possibly like in America. It's a very faulty democracy mm -hmm. where political power, no matter which party is in power, lies always with the rich and powerful against the poor. But can we succeed notwithstanding? I think we can. Can the farmers succeed? Notwithstanding, I think they can. Let's see. So um, the other thing is you're saying that uh, all of India is waking up. However, like when, as, as a member of the youth, you know, our majority of our fight is on social media. We don't get to, you know, feel out the current of the common man. So my question to you is, what is the sentiment towards BJP throughout India? You think they're going to stay in power? You think they're going to go? Like, what's going on? Is Modi popular? Monica, I don't know. And I don't want to go down this route. Mm -hmm. I don't see why you and others can't be part of the social movements in India. Why? Just because you're in America, why can't you be part of the social movements in India? Why should it have to be just on the internet? It's time. The crisis is upon us. Kala Yoga has engulfed us. Darkness is all around. And you remember what that just one Singh Kalra said when he found out about the killings of the of the Sikhs. And he came to he came to Canada and he revealed the names of several thousand people who had been disappeared by the Punjab police. And he said, I'm going back to India. And all his friends said, Don't go back to India, they're going to kill you. And the Punjab police said, Mr. Kalra, you want to know the number of people who've been killed. You come back to India and we'll give you that figure plus one. Mm -hmm. And his friend said, don't go back. Don't be. He said, I'm a little deer and there's darkness all around. But if all of you, all of us, light our lamps and become deers, we can be more powerful and brighter than the sun. Very true. So don't don't presume that you know everyone everyone in the world has to join the struggle. There are young Sikh boys and girls struggling, sitting at the at the at, at the single border. The time to support them is now, and not just internet support at all. 
the time to support the struggle in, the, in India openly and defiantly by all Indians right across the world is now. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, and thank you, Monica. Uh, let's see if there's any more questions. Anybody else uh, has a question? Looks like uh, Mr. Gonzalez has uh, numbed everybody into submission. I hope that's not the case. <laughs> I don't see any of the raised hands. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh, yes, please, uh, Kavnita, I do have another question. Sure, go so, ahead. So, Mr. Gonzalez says that uh, we need to join uh, the people who are sitting on the single border. Uh, but. Uh, no, I didn't say in that. In actual. No, no, no. Like in actual, you, no you obviously, in, you're sitting in America, you can't join yes. the people, but you can join their struggle by support. Yes. No, no, I got, I got, uh, got that point. But the thing is this, even if, uh, if somebody go and physically join it over there, there are n number of uh, uh, government powers which they try to enforce and then they put you in behind the jails and then there is no going back of people who can come out of it. Uh, there's a, some certain... I, I remember when I was a kid going to the college in, in, in Punjab and and we had a Punjab crisis going on. Uh, there was a Tata uh, uh, law which they used to put in place and throw the people into the jail. I mean, even if I go, uh, let's say I go physically go over there and try to put a support, they don't want any outsider uh, to come into the country and try to put the support on. And and uh, Khalsa Aid is one of the organization which they have been uh, putting fingers on, although they do a good uh, service to the all the communities in the world around. My question is how to overcome that kind of situation. You know, I know there is no not a single answer to it, but yeah, there, like, is, there, is, there is a very that. simple answer, Pitinder. I'm very sad to hear you speak like this. That there are so many problems, and they are likely to arrest us, and they are likely to do this, and they are likely to do that. There are tens of thousands of young Sikh men and women today who know this and yet say, and yet they say, I don't care. It's a fundamental fight for my dignity. We can't think like this. And if we think like this, then give up. There are no, thousands, ten, but just wait a minute, please. There are tens of thousands of people who are at the border, going back, organizing, doing this, doing that, spreading to other cities, going to meet farmers. Our gurus taught us, no, Pitinder, that even if you are alone, you will stand and fight. And if you have to give your life, you give your life. And if your children have to give their lives, they'll give their life. Our gurus taught us, Pitinder, they didn't teach us this. No, so I'm not saying... No, wait, you listen to me, please. Yes. Because you must lead. You must not, you must not sow the seeds of fear. You must crush that, uh, that feeling inside you and become brave now. Your religion more than anything else teaches you to, to fight. Your guru set the example. And Sikhism is such a, such a powerful and proud and inspiring religion. We are not bothered by these fears and failures in the past. We don't, we don't recognize that. As a true Sikh, I don't recognize that. I say no. Am I right? Yes. Is the government wrong? Yes, it's wrong. Should we act in whatever small, big, medium way we can act? Yes. Should we dispel doubt? Yes. Not spread doubt. Are we, are we weak against the strong? Yes. We are weak of numbers. We are weak in money. We are weak in that kind of way. We're not weak in spirit. We are stronger than the state in spirit. Are we on the moral high ground? Yes. You must fight notwithstanding anything. And you must spread that, not spread the, the old tradition of fear. You must get out of that. 
Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez, and uh, really appreciate you bringing uh, the very critical issue of the sex chardi kala of uh, forever uplifting optimism to be kept at the forefront. So thank you for that. Uh, we've got uh, it's not Mohan. Optimism. Uh, it's not optimism. It's not optimism. It's moral certitude. It's the absolute inside you, which every religion teaches, that inside you, you have a power to change the world. You have to look neither left nor right or behind you to see who's following you. Your absolute is inside you. Your spiritual strength is inside you. It's not optimism. It is spiritual certitude that you are on the right path and if somebody comes to take your life, so be it. But you are not deterred by the number of people who have joined you. And you're not afraid because you are alone. Because your spiritual upbringing teaches you that. That even alone, you are better than them all. That is what it is. It's a spiritual uprising of the Sikhs. It's a spiritual uprising of the farmers. It's a spiritual uprising of Indians against oppression in this country. That's what it is. And that is why we will win. That is why we will win. May not be tomorrow. We will win. Because we have spiritual certitude. Absolute confidence in the absolute inside us. That we are right. And they are wrong. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. We've got uh, Mohan uh, Vairakannu, uh, who has a question. Um, yeah, um, maybe not a question, actually. Uh, you know, great speech by uh, Mr. Colin. Uh, great uh, inspirational speech. Uh, amazing, amazing how you, you know, inspire everyone here to, to you know, continue the fight. And then, and you state, you know, initially that agriculture is the survival of farmers and then survival of a human being, you know, uh, for in, in India, people eat every, every, everyone have to eat. And this government is, you know, blocking that. They don't like it. They don't want everyone to survive. They want only the, you know, the upper class business people want to do something uh, and they don't care about the common people. I represent, I'm from Tamil Nadu and we have a, um, you know, political action come uh, back, political like Tamil American political uh, action committee. Um, they, we, we, it is, uh, we, we have uh, three times, I think we, we from uh, North Carolina, we represented, uh, we went to along with our Sikh brothers uh, in, in, in Washington DC twice and, um, uh, and uh, we are with 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 the team, and then now we wanted to align also with American Sea Council. I think I spoke to Kavneet uh, Singh last week, and um, we are uh, we are with you. And I know that you are fighting for whole India, but it is it seems that others are like taking rest and uh, you know doing. They don't know unless they come to them, they will realize is is uh, the and your speech is. Uh, great, sir. I just want to uh, mention about Tamil American United Political Action Committee. Um, you know, three. We, we one time we had a, a we briefed our uh, uh, American Congress. Uh, uh, she's a Foreign Affairs Committee. So, uh, Kathy Manning, and then uh, she's a Congresswoman, another Congresswoman, uh, Deborah Ross, and then uh, State Senator uh, Wiley Nickel. We we briefed them, and then they 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 said they have the news. They see the news uh, in um, you know New York Times and other things, and uh, they are aware of that what the Indian government is doing, blocking all the media, not the news not going out. And, uh, you know, I agree with uh, Colin sir that we will continue and we will be fight. I, we just, I just want to uh, give a brief update, uh, update about uh, Tamil Americans Political Action Committee uh, team. And we have a few people joined from the team and uh, we are also, you know, uh, work closely, want to work with the uh, uh, American Council team. Thank you very much. Mohan, that is very kind of you. Thank you for that shout out and uh, the work you're putting in. And I want to also want to thank the Tamil American audience who have joined us on this, uh, you know, occasion. So thank you. And uh, the next question is from uh, Monica Kaur again. Please unmute. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Gonzal Gonzalez. Um, have you had the opportunity to visit the protest sites? And if so, what was your opinion? Or experience? Yes, I've been to the protest sites several times and it's inspiring 
very inspiring. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Um, let's see if there are any other questions and uh, we'll take another two, maybe at the most three questions and we'll close. Uh, Anyone else want to take a shot at, uh, because it's not easy to get Mr. Gonzalez. He's, he's, he, his time is more than 24 hours a day. Uh, Kavneet, I just want to say some one thing. Uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, it, my intention was not to sow a seed of fear, actually. It's just the system is so corrupt and polluted that I have, I have uh, there are some occasions which I had to face one-on-one -on -one with the system, you know. So, uh, that's why I'm, I, I raised that question. Uh, it's my, I really apologize that if you think that way, that I was kind of had a fear of uh, that kind, but uh, that was not my intention. Uh, thank you, Preetinder. I appreciate uh, you bringing that up. Any other questions from the audience, especially the, the senior folks who are watching? Um, Okay, uh, in that case, uh, 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 Mr. Con Mr. Gonzalez, can you, I don't see any of the hands. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a question in reference to some of the things you've mentioned. Is it possible that moving forward, the, there's a huge mass movement going on at this very moment? Yes, you've got Punjab, you've got Haryana, you've got uh, uh, Western UP and parts of Rajasthan, that's the bulk of the population which is actually physically present at the protest sites on all the five different highways. Yes, there are also people, handfuls of people compared to the amount of people who are there in the north from, from Tamil Nadu, from Kerala, from Andhra Pradesh, Maharashtra, etc. And they're having difficulty getting to the site because uh, the BJP, wherever they have power in different states, is putting extreme pressure on those people not to get to New Delhi and thereabouts. Now, under the circumstances, that pressure is going to continue. So while this movement uh, continues physically for the next several months, who knows, we don't know what the time frame is. In the background, is there uh, anyone or any folks without naming names working on a plan B as to put a legal framework of all the wants and asks uh, together so that it can be presented to this, the various states because this is a state subject. It could be Punjab, it could be Haryana, et cetera, because uh, the, the things we're talking about are, are not, some of those laws are not a central subject. Agriculture is a state subject. So are there some attorneys, uh, some legal experts, some agriculture experts, et cetera, working behind the scenes to formulate something to keep it ready in this long chess game? See, there are many people who have ambitions to go to court and fight a court battle. But the farmers' unions are unanimous that they have no faith in the legal system and they will not go to court no matter what. Now, that is something we must all understand. It's a very widely held opinion. And they are right. As an advocate, I would say they are absolutely right. And as for plan B, it's like asking those who were asking for the removal of the British. Is there a plan B in case we don't succeed in removing the British? There is no plan B. There is only a struggle for dignity and life. And there is no plan B. And there is no plan to go to the courts. There's a plan for struggle. And I would request you and your association Please generate as much support as you can, politically, financially, and otherwise, for the farmers' unions that are struggling. And take your young people from wherever you are in America. Take them to the Punjab today. It will be an education of a lifetime. Take them to their home, homes of their ancestors to meet with the people today, to go to the border and see. Anyone can go. Anyone can be there. Don't be afraid. Nothing is going to happen to you. Go to the border, sit for some days, raise for some money for food, give everybody food, give them medical aid, do these things, join the movement. And your sons and daughters, if they come and see, it will be an education of a lifetime. 
education of a lifetime to see what it means to be truly a freedom fighter in India today. And there's no fear that the police will come and pick you up just for standing in a, in a demonstration and shouting slogan and giving medical aid or giving, you know, other kinds of aid, you know, cooking for people. You can't, nobody's going to put you in jail for that. Don't be, don't be afraid like that. But bring young people to India to see what is happening in the Punjab today. They will never get a chance like this to understand true spirit. It's historic what's going on. It's a historic moment. Don't miss it. Your children and their children should not miss it. I think what you just said, Mr. Gonzalez, is just, uh, you know, so apt. And I wish all the parents and the folks from all the various communities who are in the audience right now uh, really take it to heart. And uh, at least some of us, you know, make an attempt to follow through with what you're saying. So thank you. We'll take two more questions. Uh, the next question seems to be from Monica Kaur again. Please unmute. Oh, no, I'm sorry. My uh, hand, I never took my hand down. Oh, okay. okay. Well, uh, in that case, anybody else? I don't see any of the questions from, the, again, the seniors or from any other folks who have joined from the Tamil American community. Uh, I think that Amran is a high school student. Do, do you want to ask a question? The, you know, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, is a very inspiring personality, and I think now is your time to ask questions. So, <laughs> do ask. Okay, uh, looks like uh, there are no more questions. So, without much further ado, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, is, is that Sir Kripal Singh? Right. I just okay. want to thank Colin for doing a fantastic job and explaining the kind of uh, situation we are in and absolutely he's right you know that the uh, the farmers uh, need to be supported and uh, their cause understood and uh, uh, he definitely has a very good grip on the situation uh, and i really thank him for a very uh, organized and uh, uh, and very informative uh, presentation. Thank you, Sir Kapal Singh. If you want uh, more people like him, you know, I, I'm pretty sure, you know, that uh, there is a quite a big, big group of people over there, you know, at this moment, uh, who are really leading the whole cause. And all the power to them, and no doubt that uh, those people need to be supported. And I'm pretty sure that most of us are supporting in every possible way that, that could be done. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Paul Singh. Um, so <laughs> I, I think if you could get more uh, folks like Mr. Gonzalez who have deep empathy uh, and a true understanding of the human rights violations, uh, the total chaos which has been created by the current leadership in India, uh, you know, and exactly like what he said, unless and until more people step up, whether they're just regular civilians like us and others, nothing's going to change because the autocratic nature uh, for the last couple of years across the world is clear that uh, people have taken over and uh, these leaders who are, have that autocratic bent and the, the regular population in many places has become subservient to their own lifestyles. So that needs to change. We need to wake up and do something. So uh, I can't, on behalf of the American State Council, thank you enough, Mr. Gonzalez, for articulating what you put out. And a lot of us are going to be thinking tonight to every little issue you've mentioned. And uh, thank you for being extremely candid and uh, right up, you know, very upfront. So thank you once again. So with that, without much further ado, uh, I would like to close the meeting uh, with the best wishes and good health, especially to Mr. Gonzalez and everyone else who's here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.